February, our balance was $279.07. We had withdrawals of $60, and that included our monthly service fee at six months at $10 each. Uh, we had deposits of $60, and that was for memberships back in March. We had three memberships that were paid, and we've had three memberships that were paid in September. So we ended up with our balance as of today at $279.07 as we ended in February. We do have a pending transaction of $10 that is being paid through Cash App, which should show up on Monday. Um, so again, our available balance as of today is $279.07. And um, submitting this report for information and for future audit. Thank you, Ms. Clemens. Does anyone have any questions about the financial information for Mason? So this is a very good segue to open up to let you know that you can pay your PTSA dues now via May's cash app. It's dollar sign May's high PTSA. And so I will let Ms. Weeks, who is the vice president, give us more information on where we are with membership and again, how you can become a member of May's high PTSA. Mrs. Weeks. You're muted. You're muted, Terry. Terry, you're muted. I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Um, again, welcome to this new school year, this new virtual school year that's unlike any that any of us have ever seen. I want to um, say that all of the officers attended training about a month ago. And upon that training, we all officially updated our membership. So we are officially members of the Mays High School PTSA. And we would love to see all of the PTAs and PTSAs in our cluster active this school year. And with that being said, we just want to shout out all of the cluster, all of the uh, schools who are represented here. So I will start at the bottom of the list because I know I heard uh, Dr. Lawrence on the call. So Wes Manor, if you want to enter something in the, in the chat or unmute yourself and just bring greetings briefly. I'm sorry, I'm trying to unmute. Greetings from the West Manor family. We're happy to be a part of the Maze Cluster PTA, and we look forward to what you have in store this year. And um, just please know that because PTAs and PTSAs are community groups, that membership is not closed to those who are only parents at the school. So anyone across the cluster can join any other PTA or PTSA at those other schools. We're gonna move on up. Is anyone present for Peyton Forrest? If so, you can enter something in the chat. I'm monitoring that along with my colleagues. Um, or um, Yes, this know. is Cynthia Garner, I'm here. Hi, Ms. Garner. Is there anything doing? doing well? Is there anything you would like to say to the group? Um, I just wanted to say good evening. Thank you for having us. I'm excited about this amazing school year. Even though we're virtual, I, we're gonna, we're gonna make it happen like we always do. So I'm looking forward to um, kind of building up our PTA here at Peyton Forest and looking forward to the partnership. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, is anyone present for LP Miles? And there is a chat while we wait for LP Miles. Mary Palmer and everyone is $10 to join PTSA and you see the cash app and of course, um, your PTSA is at your elementary and the middle schools. You'll just need to get the way they would allow you to pay. And if you know what that is, you can enter that in the um, in the chat box as well, and we will publicize that as we are able. Okay, is there anyone? I know Cascade is on the line. Cascade, will you unmute and give bring greetings? Hello, everyone. I'm Tiffany Moman, principal of Cascade, but my daughter had to let ask me, she said, Mommy, are you coming in the form of principal or parent? Because I do have a senior at Mays High School. We love Mays High, Mays High till we die. I'm a Raider myself, class of 94. 
So this is family to me. So thank you so much for having me here. Um, and again, I am looking forward to the tremendous work so that we can keep Dr. Mays and the Mays legacy going. And I'm just glad to be a part of it in all aspects, alumni, parent, and employee. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, is I know I saw the president or vice president from Beecher Hills PTA come on, um, but if the principal for uh, for Beecher Hills is on, please unmute yourself and bring greetings. If not, Ms. Pless, will you do so? Let's see if she's unmuted. No, I wasn't unmuted. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here um, this evening. Uh, I'm Evelyn Pless, and I served on the uh, PTA last uh, last school session. We are going to have to be in process of doing similar to what the Mace Cluster is doing and asking that existing officers from the last session um, maybe take some ownership there. So uh, we'll have to work through some of that, but I just want to thank you for allowing us to attend so that we can at least hear what some of the other schools are doing to ensure that Beecher Hills Elementary School uh, is in line because uh, Beecher Hills is truly an outstanding school. Thank you so much, Ms. Pless. All right, is Jean Charles Young on the call tonight? If so, please unmute and bring greetings. If not, we will move on to the one, the only Dr. Mulata Wilkins of the amazing Mays High School. Please unmute and bring greetings, Dr. Wilkins. Hello, how are you guys doing? I am Dr. Wilkins, the proud principal of Benjamin E. Mays High School. I would like to welcome all of our um, cluster families, my cluster principals, and I also would like to let you guys know that my entire administrative team has joined us this evening as well, and we're excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilkins. And with that, again, membership for most of our PTAs is $10. You can join Mays High School PTA via the Cash App um, dollar sign Mays High School Mays High PTSA. And with no further ado, I will turn the floor back over to Ms. Brock to our uh, PTA president, Ms. Duncan. Thank you, Terry. That was awesome. So it's really great to have all of the cluster schools joining us tonight. So thank you for taking time out of your schedules to join us. And um, as you said, we're all just trying to do something different or having to do something different. But want to make sure that we can keep everyone connected with communication and knowing what's going on at the school. So again, thank you for joining us. And with that said, I am going to open up uh, for Dr. Wilkins to give us her principal's update to kind of let us know how it's been going the last first three weeks of school virtually at Mays. And so, Dr. Wilkins, if you are ready, the floor is yours, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So I am excited to tell you that virtual learning is going really well at Benjamin E. Mays High School. Today, we just completed a data talk, and we were looking at attendance, as well as the number of students that are actually logging on to the platform. I am happy to announce that we are at 97% of our students are actually logging on to the platform and actively being engaged. So I'm super excited about that. You need to know why I'm super excited, because um, in March, March of this time last year, we were at 40%, right? So from 40% to 97%, you can Im imagine the team has worked really hard at making sure that we hit those marks. Um, we have actually, our attendance have been at the 80% or higher mark. Once again, that's an achievement for us. Um, in the previous um, virtual learning experience, we were less than 80%, but we've been hitting the 80% mark um, um, consistently. So today I sent um, out a message to my Raider families to let them know I'm super proud of our Raider students and they're doing an exceptional job and doing when their part and participating in the virtual learning. 
a couple things I do want to share out is that one key thing we wanted to improve upon is about communication. And so every week, the team and I have worked really hard in trying to streamline that communication. So our parents should receive something called the Parent Rater Report. It started last week. We will send that out every single Friday. With that, you will find updates and resources. So we're asking our parents, we'll send that out through email. So it'll, and this also will be on our website. In addition to that communication, we are also offering this week on Tuesday something. It's our first parent university. This is an opportunity for our parents and for those who need assistance to support their students with um, Google Classroom, as well as um, the Zoom app. We're, at, we're offering a class that will be on Tuesday. That information can be found on our website. And in addition to this, we are going to offer our first, hopefully very successful virtual parent conference night that is going to be on Wednesday from 3 to 5 30. Um, updates and information you can find we update our website weekly so we were we are asking our parents and our community to continue to check our website for updates and information anytime that they need and the last update or two more updates I'm going to offer every Wednesday this month I am offering um, virtual office hours. So if parents have any questions, concerns, they just want to chit chat, um, I actually have a Zoom link. I am there from four to five, um, from four to five every Wednesday for our parents to just stop by. It's not a group meeting, it's one-on-one. -on -one, so any questions or concerns, you can always visit me there. And lastly, in order to give more updates, we're going to do a pulse check on um, or September the 24th. It's called a fireside chat where my team and I would allow parents to submit questions. We're going to do something like Facebook Live or Instagram Live where we're able to just give more details about how the virtual learning experience um, is being successful at Benjamin E. Mays High School. But up to this point, we have had three successful weeks and I am very happy about what is happening. I'm looking forward to what, what's going to happen in the next three weeks. So I appreciate it. Awesome. That's an awesome update. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilkins, for your leadership. Thank you for the love you have for the children at Mays. And thank you for being a great communicator and just wanting to make sure that the parents and staff are kept in the loop of everything that's going on at Mays High School. So thank you very much. And so with that- And I appreciate you guys' support as well. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks. You look so pretty. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and so with that, we're going to move on to the meeting because we have some exciting information to share tonight. So I'm going to turn the meeting over to Don Brockington Shaw so that she can introduce our special guest that will help us know how it is that we need to prepare for all this craziness that's going on in the world. And so Don, I am going to uh, turn over the meeting to you so you can introduce our guest. All right, so here, hi everyone. My name is Dawn Brockington Shaw. And before I actually introduce Captain Canton out of APD Zone 4, I do want to say a big thank you. Um, so I was actually trying to get some prizes and gifts for people that participated or came to the meeting. And when I spoke with Ms. Nash that you see on the screen, she actually said that a lot of people, actually it seems as though everyone has PPE, um, personal protection equipment, but a lot of people, their masks are falling apart and they need more. So after talking to her, um, Fire Chief Randall Slaughter and her decided that they would donate. They actually gave us 4,000 masks. And so we actually delivered those masks. And so the way we came up with 4,000, um, basically we looked at every single student that's registered for meals to be delivered to them on Mondays. And so each of those children, we stuffed little sandwich bags with 10 masks each. So each child, when they get their meals on Monday, the 14th, they will also receive 10 um, um, face masks. So that again, I just want to make sure that we say a big thank you to Atlanta Fire Rescue, um, very generous. And that actually, that donation, it was funded by the CARES Act. So, so by the way, I do have additional masks. I actually have a couple hundred more. Um, so they gave us a lot. So if anyone needs some, I left some at Maze. And so if people are coming up and they're without a mask, um, I can bring a couple of boxes over. They're 50 in a box. And so that way, just in case, you'll have them. So just, again, just email me or reach out and I can drop some off at your school. So again, thank you to Atlanta Fire Rescue. All right, so let's get started with prepping and preparedness. So again, um, Captain Canton, um, would you please unmute your phone? There you go, he's already unmuted. All right, so 
Captain Canton and I have kind of gone through this prepping and prepared this meeting before for uh, my specific community and it was extremely well received. And one of the things people kept saying is, you know, you think about the civil unrest, you think about how people are being impacted by all the jobs closing and evictions and all of these different things going on, but kind of what can you do to put a little control back in your life when so many things are out of control? And so prepping and just being prepared is really about doing the things you can do in order to make sure you're prepared. And so we are actually gonna go through quite a bit of information. We're gonna talk about where you can get all kinds of resources, what type of things you actually need in your home, because if we do have civil unrest, and then I'm gonna actually pass it over so Captain Canty can kind of talk about how the police force is kind of preparing for the 11 weeks in between um, the election and inauguration. So we're gonna get into that. So really, if you need to shelter in, if you need to kind of you know, hunker down, what do you need to have in your home? How do you stay safe? What can you do to your home? If you live in an apartment, what can you do? So these are all things we're gonna talk about tonight. All right, so again, welcome um, Captain Canton. And as you can see in the why we prepare, again, there are so many things. Everyone, I'm, I don't know if you've seen the orange skies over California and Oregon from all of the wildfires. So you never know when a natural disaster, I think we had, what was the, the tornado call, the land tornado that hit, I think it was in Iowa. Um, of course, we've seen the civil unrest. There's still food shortages. They're actually anticipating that there's gonna be a disruption in the food supply. So we're gonna talk a lot about how do you prep and ways, even if you're on a budget, if you've lost your job, what can you do to make sure you have maybe three months to five months worth of food on hand? So again, if you do lose your job, if there's something that's happening in the streets, you don't have to go out. So quick reminder of some dates of things you need to be aware of. Election day, Tuesday, November 3rd. Um, also, we have the early voting period. So people that if you want to get out and not stand in really long lines, hopefully, um, early voting period starts October 12th and it ends Friday, October 30th. And then of course, you're going to have Tuesday where we vote. If you're voting by absentee ballot, you must have your ballot in the mail and it must arrive at the county election office by election day. So remember everything that's going with the postal service, right? That's another issue. So you wanna make sure if you're using absentee ballots that you get them in, I would say at least two weeks in advance to make sure that your vote is counted. And then of course we have the presidential inauguration that's on Wednesday, January 20th. So these are all really important dates. And again, everyone is basically saying, be prepared coming up to the election. And so Captain Canton, um, welcome to the call. And so I'm allow you to jump in and kind of talk a little bit about this and then we'll go to um, our eight areas. Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm glad to see everybody here, but um, I'll cover this uh, pretty brief for you guys. I won't go into too much detail on a lot of this stuff, but as you guys are aware, um, we've had a lot of civil unrest and that does take away some of our resources that we normally use for patrol functions and stuff. So, Everybody, like I said, that's watching the news and is aware, and just like Miss Don said, this election is going to be huge. You got a lot of different people talking about it, a lot of different groups that are coming out either in support of the president or in support of Mr. Biden. So as right now, it's looking like this is probably going to be a, at least a contested election. I'm what I mean by contested is we're looking at what happened in 2000. If you guys remember the um, Gore president, Bush Gore, where we actually had to wait for a couple weeks and actually had to go to court before we actually decided, they decided who we had as a president. Um, so we're concerned about that, obviously, because like I said, the absentee ballots, you know, they're going to take some while to count. So we may not have all the states reporting right away. And we're worried that that's going to cause problems with different groups. So we're trying to do the best we can to prepare and get everybody ready for that. So we're pretty sure, like I said, some people are not going to be happy about it. Some people will be happy about it. We just don't know right now. So that's some of the things that we're looking at for the civil unrest because we've had a lot of protests that have changed. Um, we're happy that you're protesting. We, we encourage it. That's your First Amendment rights. But some of the protests have devolved into small riots where we've had different extremist groups like Antifa come in. And when we're arresting these Antifa members that are dressed in all black and having backpacks with bricks in them, 
and they're using fireworks that actually have nails put into them so they explode and cause shrapnel well that's that's not a peaceful protest so that's going to create us cause us to have some issues and cause us to be pretty busy with um different things that we have going on downtown because that group just um showed up again this past weekend this past weekend um we were all downtown um no, I'm sorry, not Labor Day weekend. The prior to that, they were downtown because they were trying to go back over and take over the ICE and immigration building. So with that being said, we're, we're preparing the best we can for the civil unrest and getting through that. Again, you got natural disasters that you gotta, just gotta prepare for too. You know, hurricanes and they're starting to pick up and big storms and stuff. So I'm moving along a little bit just so I'm not tying you guys down too much. Um, I think you moved the screen a little bit. Uh oh, did you want me to go back? There you go. Yeah, I was just going to say, so we were talking about that. Uh, you, you briefly covered the job losses. I know that's going to impact a lot of people. And then food supply and food shortages. As you guys were aware of, when we were um, having those issues with the COVID, um, we're worried about that coming back because, you know, a lot of your grocery stores, they need a truck to come in. They need a delivery to come in every three to four days to restock. I mean, we had a serious issue with a lot of the grocery stores that were kind of depleted because everybody was worried and scared about what was happening and what was going on. So, I mean, toilet paper, toilet paper was gone and a lot of other resources were gone, a lot of meat products and stuff like that. We're still facing that issue because COVID is still a issue across this country. It has not gone away, it is still here. With that being said, a lot of these manufacturers, wood manufacturers and other businesses that are making products are working with limited staff. So right now with the, um, the election being in November, I just highly suggest that if you know you need something, if you know you need you know, a certain amount of food or whatever, we're just asking that you slowly start to accumulate that now, slowly stock that up. If you know you need a certain medication, please start getting that now. Your doctors will easily give you a 90 day supply of whatever medication that you need and most insurance companies will cover it. I know I've talked to quite a few of them and that's gonna be really important because if stuff starts to go a little bit crazy for us in November, because of the election, we're not sure. We're just trying to pay devil's advocate here. We're not sure exactly what's going to happen. We don't have any secret information or anything, but we're just trying to make sure we're prepared for the worst and hoping for the best. I think that's pretty normal for most of your big city departments. So with that being said, there may be an issue with trying to go out and getting different supplies, diabetic supplies, other medications. So try to make sure you're prepared at least before the November election. Please do whatever you can, get out and vote. We fully support you guys. We want you guys to do whatever is possible, but just prepare, just be prepared. That's all we're asking for. Make sure that if you cannot get out just due to either a storm or natural disaster or something else happening at the end of the year, just make sure you have that supply available. Don't go month to month or day by day. Try to avoid that. Try to make sure you have that stuff available for you. All right. So Ms. Don, you want to go to that next one? Yeah. So previously with this other neighborhood group, they, they wanted to know about security and different things that they could do around their houses. So we kind of briefly talked about that. Um, some of the security that they were interested in was the carrying concealed weapons. Uh, a lot of you guys are aware of that we are an open carry uh, state. As long as you guys uh, go down to the courthouse and apply for your, your license and stuff, okay. we're very happy about that. Um, wait, you moved all over that place. No, no, no. I was going to let you talk about since you're talking about the concealed carry. Oh, okay. So you yeah. moved it over here. Okay, gotcha. I'll, I'll send it back. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to go straight down that list, oh, okay. just to cover that list if you want to run back through there. Okay, there you go. Okay, perfect, perfect, because I didn't print it out this time. So we talked about that. So, guys, if you're going to get a gun, please help us out. Um, I talked about this to the other neighborhoods us groups. We've had a large number of handguns stolen, a lot larger this year than we had in the previous year. And that's a surprise to us because most of the conventions and thefts happen downtown. 
So with a lot of the conventions and sporting events shut down, why are we seeing this massive increase on in guns? And that's because everybody's kind of a little scared about what's going on, unsure of their safety, unsure of what's going on. All right, so we got that. So please, if you're gonna get a gun, please be responsible. If you know you can't carry it at a certain location, then try not to bring it, try to leave it in your house because a lot of these guns are making it back on the streets. And of course, you know, we've had a huge increase in homicides. We're up almost 40% this year and aggravated assaults is also up. So try, if you're going to get a gun, try to take the class, take the training and be responsible for it with it. Other security things we talked about is due to me, I've been on the department over 20 years. So I've gotten to talk to a lot of burglars. Burglars don't like dogs. For some reason, they, they try to avoid houses with dogs, lights, and other things that'll illuminate their their position. So if you're going if you're gonna have a house and you're trying to do some additional security, get a dog that barks that'll alert you that somebody's either outside. Look at motion lights, look at motion security lights, um, anything like that to actually illuminate your house. What we did also with uh, Miss uh, Shaw's neighborhood is we actually had our people go out there and we actually did an assessment on the neighborhood to make sure that the bushes, trees, shrubs were all cut back and the lighting was adequate. Because as long as you got adequate lighting, somebody's probably not gonna approach your house during the night to try and break in. They're gonna look for a dark house, unlit, looking for some way that they can get into that house and be unnoticed. Other things that you want to do with the uh, security is important documents. Make sure you got all your important documents put away in one location. So if you have to get out of that house very fast because of a fire or because of another issue, you can grab that documentation and have it. Um, we've seen that multiple times with apartment complexes and other places where they've had a fire and all of a sudden the person's trying to put back their life, trying to get a hold of the banks, trying to get a hold of different things. And all that information was all out throughout the house. If you got it all nicely organized, once we put you in contact with the Red Cross, the Red Cross will tr try to make arrangements to get you shelter for a couple days. That'll at least give you the ability to start calling the banks, start reaching out, tell them what happened, start getting re replacement credit cards, replacement checks and other things. So that's important to try and keep all that stuff organized and keep it together. Just like I said, just if you have to leave real quick because something's happening, you can. Community, cert, uh, community and security details. Now we talked about this with her neighborhood. Um, her neighborhood wanted to establish a neighborhood watch. Now that's easy for a lot of neighborhoods to do. The problem is, is it gets a little more complicated if you are in a complex or an apartment complex. So with uh, the neighborhood security details, try to always talk to your neighbors. Your neighbors are going to be your biggest asset because when you're not home, there's a good chance that they may be held to be home. They may be able to watch your house. They may be able to tell you if somebody's coming to your house or if somebody's watching your house or driving by and looking at your property that you may not notice. So that's going to be really important to set up those uh, neighborhood groups because also you don't know who's your neighbor. You may actually have a nurse that's living next door to you that could actually be beneficial, especially if you're outside and you get hurt while you're waiting for 911 to respond. Because like I said, during these protests, we had an issue where we had an increased response time with um, 911 due to the ambulances being tied up and then the ambulances and the um, fire trucks not wanting to go into certain neighborhoods because of the civil unrest. So that actually delayed a lot of uh, response times. So I just wanna make sure you guys are aware of that too, just to make sure that you are watching out for that. Food, gardening, seeds, seeds and pet food, fishing traps. We talked about that. There was a, we went into depth on that and that was part of the prepper side. Uh, we had that, a uh, neighborhood group that wanted to make sure that they were prepared for more than two to three weeks. So this is probably something this group's probably not going to want to do, but there's a lot of uh, different things that you can look up for prepping categories. And what I mean by prepping is preparing for future issues and disasters. And by making sure you had food supply for two to three weeks, 
what we were talking about with that is obviously if the electricity's out, you're going to want to have beans, you're going to want to have canned goods. Canned goods and other materials like that will stay unrefrigerated and can, can uh, like I said, give you a food source for a couple weeks. So those are some of the things that you definitely want to look at, uh, especially if you know you're probably not going to be able to go out to the grocery store, or depending on depending on what happens in the area or depending on what's going on. We talked about water, one gallon per day. Again, this goes back to the prepper side. So I don't know how in depth you guys want to go with this. I know Don, I know the other community wanted to really go in depth. They were going all in for the uh, prepper stuff. <laughs> That's why we had generators listed. Yeah. And fireplace candles and other things. Cell phone power banks, but that's somebody that that's something that can affect everybody. Well, we I'll just, I'll just Captain Canton, um, on the water, uh, just in anything. So I don't think probably all of us have had bold water advisories, right? Everybody, yes. everybody. So just think about if there was another bold water advisory and it was for a week, right? And so how would you clean your water? And so one of the things that we talk about is it doesn't matter. And this could be for, you know, like any disaster, any of the things we talked about earlier, you want to make sure that you have one gallon per day per person. If you look on the screen, that's an aquatainer that actually holds seven gallons of water. And if that's literally one week's worth of water that you would be able to use. Another thing on another um, slide, I have a picture of a water bob and it's actually kind of cool. So I'm from Florida. So anybody on any kind of coast, you're typically used to, if there's any kind of storm coming, you fill your bathtub up, right? That becomes an easy source of water. Well, what the water bob, it, water bob is, is basically really thick plastic that you fill up with water and it keeps the water clean and has a pump. So you can easily get water out and it holds hundred gallons. So you actually put it in your tub and it holds the water and it keeps it clean in your tub. Um, and it's actually, I think like literally, I think mine was like $39. That was with tax and shipping. So you want to make sure that you have multiple ways to make sure you always have water on hand. Um, Captain Canton, what is it? You can go, how long can you go without food? Is it like a long time? And then yeah, you can go almost 30 days without food, but you can only go three days without water. Exactly. So making sure you have clean water, because a lot of times when there's incidents, typically people get sick from dirty water. Um, another thing is that if you have filters, maybe it's a Brita filter. I have a big Berkey, which is, I think, in the um, top right hand corner. So you can put sludge through that and it will clean it and you will come out with clean water. No matter how you do it, you should always have a way to make sure in your home you have clean, you have clean water for everyone. So I just wanted to kind of add that. And another big thing is that gardening. So you have, we have the garden and seeds. So even if you're in an apartment, um, you're always, and we're gonna get to bartering down at the bottom. Think about the things you're good at or things you can do that if we were in a shutdown situation, what could you barter, right? What, do, what skill set, if you're a nurse, can you sew? What can you do that you can actually barter in order to, again, if you needed to secure things that you need in your home and for your family? So I'll hand it back over to you to go to energy. Oh, no, no, please. I don't mind trading off with you because you did as much research as I did. That's <laughs> good to know. Definitely. But yeah, that's definitely important. Know, know what skill set you have and what you can bring. Cell phone batteries and backups. You be, would not believe how many people we've brought here that have been either victims or, or other issues. And their cell phone is at 5%. Um, that doesn't do you any good. So I always try to make sure you have something, the cell phone or power you up or anything to help you with. Gas grills yes, um, and charcoal grills, that's also going to be important, especially well, if good. we that's lose right. electricity. Thank you. Equal. Thank you. Especially if we lose electricity, just so you can cook up uh, food. You're going to want to do that. If we have a big storm, which actually I'm a heavy believer in the um, Farmer's Almanac. I love the Farmer's Almanac. But the farmer's on that is saying we're supposed to have a cold, wet winter this year. So if we happen to lose power and stuff, you want to be able to make sure you can still heat up your food and stuff. And then uh, the last thing down here is the cash on hand. Cash is great to have, silver, gold, and other precious metals. Well, that's if we are really starting to have a problem where society is starting to really fall apart because of all the issues. I'm hoping we don't ever get that far. I'm hoping we just have a couple uh, bad protests or issues and everything kind of levels out. Did you want to go to the next slide? 
Yeah, and I just want to add on the energy. One of the things that's really easy, if your power goes out, I think you talked a little bit about having grills, but um, charcoal right now is easily accessible and it's not expensive. I would definitely recommend like stacking up on charcoal or anything. Um, there are all types of like, you know, propane, um, little grills, camping grills, but make sure that you have a way to be able to cook food. Um, and what else was I was gonna, what else was I gonna add? Oh, and the bartering. Um, just one more thing that is funny, like maybe get a circle. So I actually have a pretty strong group of friends that all of us pretty much are like, okay, kind of what do you have, what do you have? So that if you need to, the barter piece is really, really big. So that way, if you can't get to the, um, to the grocery store, I will tell you when we were starting to have some of the riots in Atlanta, I don't know if you guys remember the, the Walmart right off of Cascade actually shut down. It closed down. So if we get that again, where Publix feels as though people are going to riot or they're going to storm it, they will just shut down. So all of a sudden you may be in a food desert. So again, you just want to make sure that you have something that you can barter. And the last one at the bottom is shelter. And so this one, if you know older people, especially if you have children, you want to make sure that there's a plan for grandparents, parents, et cetera, so that if something were happening, you probably don't want them by themselves in their home or just have a central place for your family to come. So that's another one. Are you gonna actually stay in your home and your loved ones will stay in their home or will you actually leave? So if you leave, it's called bugging out. Um, if you're gonna go to another location to kind of ride out the issues. Um, but if you're gonna shelter in place, that's sheltering in place. And the other thing people recommend is, just in case, I always say if the mothership comes, you wanna make sure you have your passport, right? So you can get on it. So making sure if you, um, if that's an option, having your passports up to date, um, passports are taking a little longer to get. And we've already talked about the three months of medication. So those are the eight general areas. So I guess Captain Canton, we've already talked a little bit about security, but you can kind of give some specifics of things people yes. can actually use in their home and their apartments to stay secure. Yeah. So as you guys are aware, we have, um, little inspectors that will come out to your neighborhood. Now they're currently not working because of the COVID crisis. So they are currently home and we're having to try and backfill the best we can, but they will come out and do a security assessment for your house or your apartment and take a look at seeing what they can recommend. Some of these things that are on here are some of the things that you can easily find at Lowe's or Home Depot that are going to be very cheap. The window lock. This window lock is only a couple bucks, but what it does is it actually locks on to the frame itself. So if somebody, if you got your window open because you want fresh air, because it's temperature has been dropping late at night, um, there's a good breeze just to kind of blow out the house. By twisting this and putting this in the frame, it'll prevent the window from being open more than a couple inches or whatever you want it programmed at. That's real important to stop somebody from opening your window all the way and sliding in. Um, also, security sash pins, those are important too. Though some of the older windows actually have holes where you can put them in, or actually you can just put in a screw if you're in an older, older house. Just be careful you're not messing with the mechanism or the weights in the older houses that actually have the weights that go up and down in the actual window frame. Now, a one-by-one -one dowel, this is very cheap at Home Depot, but very effective. A lot of people have sliding glass doors in the rear of their houses, and some of them actually have them in the apartments. These actual door locks that actually prevent, you know, that the rear of the houses are really flimsy. They're very easy to bypass. You can actually add security to your house and your sliding glass door by just sticking this plain dowel rod in the actual frame down at the bottom so that way a perpetrator can't pop the lock and slide that glass easily he's going to run right into that piece of wood it's not going to allow him to slide that door open so that's a really easy security fix to help with a bad lock um, some of the things down here is the door knob jammer these are a lot more expensive um, they work out great if you have a wooden floor by your entry because you can set the adjustment and all it does is it puts pressure on the back side of the actual door, um, the door jam. This will prevent and help uh, slow things down if a person's trying to kick in your door. Also, you got the wireless door alarm down here. That's good too. If you don't want to spend the money for that, just get like a bell, um, cheap bell, cowbell, 
I use those at my house. Uh, drives my dog nuts, but at least, like I said, if a door is open, I, I know it's open because I can hear the bell ringing. Invisible burglar bars, that's also a lot more expensive. And then we're going into the camera system. We personally love the camera system. If somebody's gonna get into your house, we want pictures, we want video. That helps us track down the persons or the perpetrators and what happened. So these are great. So if you guys can buy these, wonderful. Other security things that um, just from talking to burglars over the years is security lighting. Obviously they don't want to be seen. They don't want you to see them. They wanna be able to do their business and not be noticed. If you got a motion sensor light that's kicking on, great. A lot of burglars said they'll go to the next house because they're not sure what's in that house. You want that. And then also, like I said, if lights popping on off and on and your neighbor knows you and you have a relationship with that neighbor and that neighbor knows that, hey, they're out of town, that light shouldn't be popping on. Maybe they'll take a little bit harder look and just see what's going on. And if they see somebody walking around the rear of your house at eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night, then uh, give us a phone call. Let us uh, come check it out. If in doubt, like I said, we tell all of our young officers and our communications people, if in doubt, send them out. Just let us go ahead and check it out. Let us talk to these people. Let us see what's going on. Um, if you got a long driveway, wireless door alarms is real important. Um, that'll help you guys out, um, let you know who's driving up your door, up your driveway to your house. And then the original Nighthawk, and these are all different versions of uh, door jams. These are going to be a little bit more expensive than the other options. So let me jump down to the bottom of the slide here. Now, most of you guys, I'm very sure, are familiar with Amazon. And this is a great do-it-yourself project. This is window film. I have window film in my house because I live in the city also. But this way, if the window's broken out, it doesn't shatter completely. It'll take a while. I put on enough film that you could probably hit my windows with a baseball bat a couple times and it's not gonna break right away. It's gonna be very hard to get in. So I have over eight millimeters of uh, film. But like I said, you can do this yourself. It's a nice do-it-to-yourself project. I had mine professionally done. That's a little bit more money, but it's just to strengthen the glass. So that way the glass is not gonna break. It's kind of like a go between between regular windows and burglar bars so that way if somebody's trying to get in they're trying to break that glass you're going to know it before they actually get into the actual house or break into the window so this is just another picture an example of um, the window um, film where a guy's trying to break in you want to go to the next slide yes <laughs> All right, so we had a long talk about this. Um, what is suspicious behavior? So we've had this happen in a couple of our neighborhoods in zone four in Southwest Atlanta over the summertime, where we've had um, young guys pull up in a, in a van or pull up in a pickup truck and they're going to people's houses with a piece of paper and saying, hey, I wanna give you pine straw or something. Well, okay, you wanna sell me pine straw but you're walking around my house, knocking on the door, looking in my windows. That's kind of a little bit more suspicious because as soon as you come to the door, what we've noticed and we've gotten calls about is as soon as that person comes to the door, they're handing them a piece of paper that says pine straw for sale. And then they're walking back to the vehicle, getting in and leaving. Of course, there's no company name. There's no company address. There's nothing on there saying how they're going to sell the pine straw or how much it costs. So that's really suspicious. They're looking to see if you're home. And that type of crime goes all the way up to Buckhead for these uh, suspicious burglaries. That's why you need to know who your neighbors are. You need to know what's going on. You don't need to be in their business, but you just need to know what is suspicious for your neighborhood. What looks out of place. If you see a vehicle coming into your neighborhood, you've never seen it before, all of a sudden it's stopping, it's taking pictures of your house, and they're walking up, ringing the doorbell, looking in windows, walking around the backside of the house, and then going to the neighbor's house and doing the same thing. Yeah, that could be suspicious. Please, just give us a call. We'll check it out. Um, depending on how our call availability is, it may take us a little bit to get there, but at least that way we have it recorded. That way, if you get a tag number or something, we find it a little bit later, we can start putting together the crime and the incident. So I'll move on to the next slide here. 
did you want to cover this? I think you covered this last time. Okay, I can. So some of the best practice that um, Captain Canton and I came up with, there are three crime factors, and we learned about this in Neighborhood Watch training. Um, one, don't give people the desire. So that's part of the clean car campaign, making sure that, um, I know in my community, a lot of times it's the creepiest thing, but we have a lot of carports. So you've got to keep your car clean and that's going anywhere. So if someone just says, walk, they're walking by or they walk into your driveway, they don't see anything and there's no desire to actually steal. And of course, if there's no lighting, um, if there's nothing around for security, you're giving them the opportunity. So the idea is that you want to reduce desire, keep things out of sight, right? Make sure that there's not the opportunity or you reduce the opportunity um, and availability. So you just want to make sure that you're not available. Um, and that's by, you know, keeping your doors locked and things like that. We can't say enough about community and making sure that if people are visiting, um, and I just really quickly, just to go back to this slide about this one, this is a huge concern. And I think it's a big concern in a lot of black communities because I think we're always nervous about, do I want to profile someone and then call the cops and what if that escalates, right? We don't want to call police. So we do want to be mindful of not harassing people, but we also have to understand that with so many things going on and as people get more desperate, um, there are going to be more break-ins. You heard Captain Canton say that homicides, burglaries, everything is up like 40%. So when you have that much crime, we've got to kind of look out for each other and make sure that also who you invite. I know one of the things that I'm always very um, wary of is kind of who are you inviting to my home, and especially with our students and our children. So making sure you know who's coming into your house, because that's also availability and desire if they're walking around and looking in your home, because they'll tell other people and then they'll break into your house. So house numbers, even apartment numbers, really important. Um, learn this from Captain Canton. Um, if you call the police, and they can't find your home or your apartment because the numbers aren't visible, they waste time, right? They'll circle the block, kind of go around trying to figure out where you are. So if you're in an apartment or a home, you want to make sure apartment numbers, unit numbers, everything is visible from every direction to make sure that if you call for help, you can get there quickly. Um, USPS, that's the United States Postal Service, identity theft. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. It's called informed delivery. And if you just, you'll see if you go to the website, literally if you go to where it says it's on the um, first, the landing page, if you go to inform delivery, you can actually register your address. You want to register your address before the criminals do. That's how they can actually steal your identity. And so by actually registering, you're actually able to see your mail because they actually scan it before it comes. So you actually know what you should be getting so that if there is theft, theft or something's missing, you know. So one, it allows, it kind of reduces the risk of your identity being stolen, and you're also able to preview your mail. So it's a really cool service that the United States Postal Service um, actually provides. The next one is changing your routine um, and also knowing different ways to come home. So that can be like different timers. Um, I think Captain Canton, last time you talked about, you have so many different ways you can turn on um, lights from your cell phone, yep. um, maybe have the clappers, all types of things, but you want to make sure that you're not turning on the same lights every single day all the time. Move it around your home. Again, throw people off. They don't know if you have company or if you don't. Um, no multiple ways to get home. So again, if 285 um, is blocked, because there's an issue, I know that there was a protest where they actually crossed over 75, 85 and completely cut it off. You want to know other ways to get home. So make sure that from any area from Southwest, East, North, you're able to get to your home. Um, commercial locks are the best, that's easily said. And also, if you are going to put an um, alarm in your house, they um, recommend that you put one in the attic or outside. So again, a lot of times our home alarms, if it goes off, even in an apartment, you can only hear it in the apartment or the house. So if you want others to be able to hear it so they're alerted that something's happening, you want to make sure that the sound can get out. That so you can do that by putting it in, the, put it in your um, attic or outside. And so Captain Canton was talking about having someone come out. That is the residential security survey. So typically what happens is that they will send you a form and it looks like this. Um, and it's actually multiple pages. This is just one page. And so they first want you to go through all the different security. So this is just one page of it. And you will go through your home to see if you're able to check off yes. And then once you've completed it, you would then call and say, hey, I would like for someone to come out, go through my checklist, and then offer recommendations, which you heard from Captain Canton. 
So again, this is available from um, APD. Right now, the, as he said, they're actually working from home and so they're not coming to homes because of COVID. But you definitely want, I mean, I will email this to all the principals so that you have it, the actual form. So at least you can start going through and checking to see, okay, am I prepared? Do I have everything in place as much as I can in order to be safe? So that's the residential security survey. By the way, are there any questions? Nope. All right. And by the way, if you have a question, please, for um, Captain Canton or myself, just please, um, you can unmute yourself and ask. So we'll go ahead and we'll talk a little bit more about the Castle Doctrine and a little bit of more about gun safety, because this is huge. Um, and I'll just add before Captain Canton talks about the law. Um, I went down, so my daughter and I went down to get our carry permit, six hours to do the whole process. They should have taken like no time. And when I say the line was wrapped around the courthouse, and that's in every single county, people are going and getting carry permits. Um, ammo, you can't find ammunition anywhere, your own wait list. So if you are going to go that route, just make sure you're legal. And at this point, I am going to turn it over to Captain Canton so he can talk more about how to make sure you stay on the right side of the law if you are deciding to use a gun, shotgun, or rifle, and also kind of um, what type of bullets, all right? <laughs> okay, so I'm sure a lot of you are aware, of, and if you're not, um, Georgia is one of the few states that actually has a stand your ground law. Uh, Florida, Texas, and a lot of the other southern states do. But we also have the Castle Doctrine. The Castle Doctrine allows you to use physical force to protect your house if you're in your house. So with that, let me just say that as a grain of salt. If you can actually physically escape safely, we always recommend doing that. We always want you to not have a confrontation, if at all possible. But if somebody's breaking into your house and you're in your bedroom and all of a sudden they're coming up on you, then, like I said, you have the right to defend yourself. And that's plain and simple. We will handle that. And that's actually happened. Um, and we've actually processed those cases out. Um, let me just jump back to you guys real quick on one thing that uh, we are also noticing and, and a slight increase on. And I just wanted to talk to you guys about with the cell phones is we're starting to see cell phone thefts back ticking back up. For those of you guys that have cell phones, please write down your IME number, which is your long, it's a long number that you'll find in your phone. And there's different ways, depending on the phone product you have, just Google it. They'll tell you how to get that, write that down. And the reason I'm asking you guys to do that is if your phone is taken and it's taken over to Greenbrier Mall and sold in one of the eco ATMs, we can actually track that and get that back for, to you actually pretty quickly, as long as you have that number. But we need that IMEI number. We need that number. We don't need your phone number. We just need that actual number that talks to the, the cell towers, not the, not the actual phone number itself. So when is it legal to, or illegal to brandish a gun? Well, once you get the permit, you can have the gun on you. We prefer, um, like I said, if you're going to do that, just make sure you're trained to use it. Go to a class. Depending on where you got, go to buy your gun, they will actually give you a gun safety class. We've had a lot of people that have bought these guns and are buying the guns. Gun sales are up like 30 or 40 percent. The problem is, is no one's actually taking a class to actually use it. And we've actually had a couple victims get their own gun taken from them and used on them. That's pretty bad. So that's not something that we definitely uh, want to happen. So make sure you, you go into, um, you guys know where Atlantic Station is. There's uh, Stoddard's up there right on in Atlantic Station. They have um, really good gun classes, gun safety classes. And plus, not only that, they will let you try out different guns to let you find one that's more compatible for you. You may not want a large caliber. You may want a small caliber. They will go through all that stuff to actually find something that will work for you. And then, of course, sell it to you, but then give you the whole safety class with it. That's important. So try to do that. Just don't try to run to a pawn shop and get it. You can always do that, but just we want you to take a class. We want you to be able to load it, unload it, make it safe. Make sure you know where you're putting it. Make sure you got it out of the reach of 
kids or anybody coming to visit you. Make sure you have the serial number so if it is missing, you wouldn't believe how many times we have to go out there and we have to keep following up with the victim because they say, well, I bought it at the pawn shop, but I don't know what it is. We just need to know what it is, a make, model, and we need to know the caliber so we can run through all that stuff and help uh, get it on the system. So I kind of ran through this a little bit. Um, one of the questions that we have on here is guns, shotguns, and rifles and collateral damage from bullets. Um, we've had that kind of question come up before different community groups. Um, what do I need to buy for my house? Again, get a gun that you feel comfortable with. But if you're not comfortable with a gun or if you're not, you know, you're not seeing too well and you have a shotgun already in your house, that's fine. Get ammunition for the shotgun, like double out buck or something else that's not going to penetrate the walls. You don't, double out buck will go through at least one wall or drywall in your house, but it's probably not going to leave your house. That's really important because some people were wanting to use rifles. If you're in an apartment complex, I highly recommend not using a rifle for your own home security because those rifle rounds, especially 223 rounds, which is pretty common for the rifles, they will go through multiple walls. You don't want to do that and put other people at risk if you're trying to work on your own safety. So other than that, let, let's talk about what happens if you have a gun in the car. A gun in the car is an extension of your house. Please, if you guys are on a traffic stop with us, we're not interested in your gun. We just want to know that it's there. Just let the officer know that it's there just so that way he's more at ease, you're more at ease, and it doesn't escalate. You will get your gun back. Um, also remember places that you're going with your gun when you do have it. Say, for example, you're going to Publix. Well, Publix may not want that gun inside their business. They're going to tell you you can't enter with it. Again, if they call us, we're not interested in a gun. That's a criminal trespass issue. That's not a weapons violation. So we just want to make sure that everybody understands that and they're kind of relaxed a little bit. Because like I said, we're a very open state for gun laws. So I'm trying to think the best way that I can explain it with uh, certain questions that were asked. So with that being said, I'm going to jump on to the uh, next slide there. Okay. Okay, so you have a community plan, basic military training. So this is more or less, this is more training that we had talked about for your community, uh, Ms. Shaw, mm -hmm. where they were doing the prepping stuff. We highly encourage people to do neighborhood watches. Highly encourage that. Just as that way you know what's going on in your neighborhood. You know you guys have the ability to communicate with each other. I have a neighborhood watch in my community that I barely participate in. My block captain um, you know, lives um, at the other end of the street, but tries to keep us looped in on everything. That's real important. And then like I said, know your neighborhood's skill set. Know who's got the ability to do what, because you might be able to get help with certain things without having to pay somebody, you know, just because you know that that neighbor knows how to do it. That, that neighbor may be a mechanic or maybe former this and former that. That's gonna be important. And then also um, we talked about with her neighborhood is she wanted to have like security details during the actual protest. That's important for certain neighborhoods, especially if you got a cut through street, you want to make sure that you guys know what's going on and you guys kept in the loop. Is there anything, Ms. Shaw, you want to add to that? No, I think that's it. I think this was really about, and it kind of goes, we've really talked about it repeatedly about you've got to find some people in your community, in your neighborhood that you trust, that you can work together um, just to keep everyone safe, right? You've got to have, you can't, you can't do this by yourself yep. in the end of the day, just in general, even with, um, we're going to move into talking about food and about other preps, but um, all of this takes a community, to make sure that children are safe, to make sure that everyone is safe. You've got to make sure. So no, that's it for that. So, um, well, Captain Canton, I'm going to move into the food and other preps. If you want to stay, you can, but does anyone have, because that kind of ends his portion of kind of where he's going to contribute the most, but does anyone have any questions about the law, um, what you can and can't do? Um, are there any questions for Captain Canton? Um, I do see one. I think that, let's see here. I think someone asked, was it, what was the number on the cell phone that you should write down that I am, what was it called? 
the I let me find a real quick. It's going to be the IME number. It's the international. Um, I can send that to you if you want to get it out. Because yeah, I was actually either. making I was actually making up a flyer for that. So that way we can give you instructions on how to find it with the uh, iPhone and different ones. Because all it is is you're just pushing like a star button and some it's, uh, like six seven or something. But I want to get that out. I'll get that out to you, Ms. Shop. You can get that out to everybody else. I'll do that. I'll make sure I send it out. Perfect. Because that's important because we just noticed this uptick. So as we notice different upticks happening in our community, we try to get that out to you guys so we can kind of get ahead of it. Um, I'm sure all of you guys have seen the eco ATMs down there, which is just the ATM. looks like an ATM machine, but you actually go there to sell a cell phone. The company is actually registered and all those cell phones are then shipped to California. And what they do is they actually part them. They take them all apart and sell the parts just like a pull apart for cars and stuff. So they, um, like I said, they've been working with us trying to help us return some of these phones that have gotten snatched or taken and um, trying to get them back to everybody. But I'll definitely get that out to you guys so you can get it out to everybody. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we'll move into talking about, we've talked about security and we've talked about community. And so the next thing we've talked about is making sure you have food on hand. These are pictures of prepping um, pantries. And so you're not going to get here immediately. This is probably thousands of dollars, but it is important that you start to look at your stockpile. And so on the very last slide, and probably about three or four slides, I actually have a list of the categories of what you should start to look at and what you should start to buy, just in case you're not very familiar. But in general, in general, you want to think about if my power goes out, do I want to invest in a generator? Again, I'm from Florida, so I know people that have whole house generators, which are super expensive, all the way um, down to maybe smaller generators. So if you have a deep freezer and a refrigerator, you may want to go and say, hey, these are the watts or the amps of my you know, deep freezer, my refrigerator, maybe my microwave, toaster oven, and make sure you understand the power it takes and then get the appropriate generator. No matter what, if that's something you're interested in, start thinking about it now. Um, before I keep going, I see Jeremiah. You can unmute yourself. You have um, a question? No? Okay. So if you unmute yourself, you can. There we go. Hey. Um, just a question. Hey, Ms. Shaw. Um, I know you were talking about um, stocking up, and I know in COVID. You muted yourself again. You're muted. Oh, sorry, that mm -hmm. if you stock up on like non-perishables or like household supplies that it was a quote unquote crime, is that something that's still in place or no? Like I if you're could... caught hoard, if you're caught like um, harboring and hoarding like um, supplies, is that something that you still can get in trouble for? So that's something that was on our um, platform at one point. Really, Captain Canton, have you heard about, I've... I did not hear that at all. I did not hear that at all either. So what I was going to recommend you do is when you go to the grocery store, I bought a, I went to Costco. I bought a 10 pound bag of black beans. I'm not going to eat all that in one month, but all, it was 12 bucks. It was cheap. The black beans last three years. I just bought two. Costco had plenty. So if you're going to Publix or if you're going to Kroger's, all we're saying is, hey, listen, I, I know how much I use in one month. Well, don't buy everything at once. Slowly start to accumulate the stuff. So if you were going to the store to buy one item, then maybe buy an extra one. You don't want to bank, you know, you don't want to roll, you know, bust your um, account there and have all this stuff. Uh, you just want to slowly accumulate it, slowly build it up. You got to, you know, you got what, 52 days or 52 days left before the election. You got time. Right. Got time. Right. So I was more so speaking as far as like toiletries, toilet paper, paper towels, things like that. When there was a shortage and yes. like, you know, that was being a platform. So I was more so geared towards that, not more so food. Um, just trying to make sure that, that we're not doing this and, you know, we have these things here. I know times are crazy right now. So just weird things happen. So just want to make sure that we're in a clear and we know what we are allowed and what we aren't allowed, you know, to do in case, you know, we have, we, we start doing these type of things. Yeah, it, a lot of the um, a lot of the places that were that that I think that executive order was focusing on 
was the people that were buying it and then trying to resell it at a higher cost. Oh, okay. Those were the people okay. that were trying to gouge you guys for the cost. They rent, like um, somebody went to Costco and cleaned out all the um, all these uh, Clorox bleach wipes, and then all of a sudden they were showing up on Costco. These are what normally what ten dollars for like three or four of them, and then all of a sudden now they were for sale for like twenty dollars each. One of these things. So right, they were right. gouging. They don't want that. The government doesn't want that. That was part of the executive order. They didn't want that. That was getting the attention. Right. But if you're just going to buy, hey, listen, I need, I need one box of masks. Well, try to get an extra one just to put it aside. Because like I said, I mean, the COVID's still around, and we're getting ready right. to get into flu season. And you know, flu season starts here in October, and then it goes all the way until almost January, February. So you want to try and make sure that you are prepared and you got that stuff available because it's going to be real hard to distinguish the flu people have the flu from COVID because they're kind of exactly. Similar. So it's going to right. be real hard. So if you start coughing, wheezing, and look terrible, I'm going to be I'm going to be six feet from you wearing a mask. Right. So I want to make so sure I'm prepared. So just to clarify, Georgia is not one of those states that were that was affected by the executive order. No, no, no. We have an executive order. Governor can okay. send the orders out, but the government, when we're reading through the orders, it's for certain things. We're constantly trying to go through his executive orders. Okay. So that's all I'm saying is, is don't go to the store and buy the whole pallet. Don't buy everything. Don't buy multiple boxes. Just go to the store, do what you normally were buying, just buy yourself one or two extra. And then okay. two weeks, buy yourself another extra. Don't clean the store out. Let everybody get some stuff. But I'm just saying, just make sure you have enough to get you through at least a month. Get get you through from November to December. Because, see, even if we don't have a huge civil unrest and we the civil election goes through pretty good, you're still going to steal with COVID and you're still mixing the flu season in there. So you, you could still okay. have an impact because... You need those trucks rolling on the highways, and if the truckers get sick, the stockers get sick, you're going to have little bumps in the system. That's all right. I'm trying to point out. I'm just trying to make sure that everybody's got enough so that way, if they can't get to the store, they have to stay in. I want to make sure that you've got enough to make sure that you're safe and you're good in your house. So if you have to shelter in place for a week or two, you're good. You're covered. Okay. I just want a clarification on that. That's all. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma all right. And so as you're prepping, so you'll see on the right hand side, one of the things you want to think about, um, if again, if you can't get to the store, things like butter. So ghee, I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with ghee, but clarified butter has a really long shelf life. Um, of course, you have dry eggs. So you want to make sure you have, I mean, some people get evaporated milk, some people get dry milk, some people get the um, box milk, but Again, make sure if you if you use, if you're not vegan, if you use dairy products like cheese, milk, butter, eggs, you want to make sure, again, you have long shelf life items so that you're actually able to use them. Um, and so really, again, you want to make sure, and we're going to go through, you see the picture, but I actually have a list that I'm going to send to the principals that'll be helpful. It's a little checklist of all the different things you want to make sure that you actually have on hand. So... A lot of people have said, hey, Dawn, I'm not working. Um, it's expensive. So it's really easy to tell people, hey, go pick up. When you pick up um, whatever it is, meat or canned foods, hey, just pick up five more or pick up a couple more. Here's an idea. At the Atlanta Community Food Bank, so I called them and I called around quite a few places trying to figure out. And also, Terry Weeks, thank you very much, helped me um, quite a bit with this. Where can I go not only to get free food, food, but also other preps. So detergent, body lotion, toothpaste, laundry detergent, feminine products. So Atlanta, uh, Atlanta Community Food Bank actually provides a lot of those items, which I didn't know because my first thought is you have so many places giving out food. Well, what if I need deodorant? And so if you call them, you're actually able to get those types of things from them. So that's really important. They're actually pretty much the only, out of all the places we talk to, the only um, bank that actually provides those types of goods besides food. So again, you'll see up here, you'll see the phone number. You also have the, um, the web address, so you can go there. And actually on the next slide, I'll actually show you um, exactly how to go and find out where you can get food. 
Also, another resource is the United Way of Metro Atlanta. You can actually call 211. They also have a lot of resources that, that they can help you with. And both places, if you are not only food insecure, but also if you find that your housing is in danger, they can also put you in touch yeah, with the- Yeah, we'll just this up. What you got? Uh-oh. I'm on mute. I'm on mute. What you got? No, no, you're not on mute, Captain Kansas. Sorry. Oh, wait. <laughs> and so so if you call them they can actually help you with um things like if you're facing maybe eviction and things like that so let me go and just show you if you go to the atlanta community food bank site if you go on the landing page it'll say find a pantry near and so once you select find a pantry you go to local impact map Put in your zip code so you can see I put in my zip code and you'll see it comes up with four categories. You have food bank partners and agencies and it'll give you a map and it'll show you all the places you can go and get food. You also have mobile pantries so you have the ones that you have to go to. You have ones that if you call they possibly will come to you. You also have school pantries and you also have summer meal um, sites right and so we're kind of out of the summer. Now you'll see just in my zip code there's 74 food banks within a 15 mile radius of my house, 74. So if you click, which is which I did, if you select the 74, you'll then see where you can start. It'll give you a list of all the different food bank partners. So you'll see I pull one up. It tells me it's about three miles away or four miles away from me. And it tells me um, when, you know, when they're open and it has a phone number so you can call and confirm. So this tool I thought was the coolest thing for you to go and literally see all the resources. Now, here's the, here's the good part. If you're short on money, I would recommend finding out because some places will give you vegetable boxes. Some people give you starch. Some people give you meat boxes, right? So I would literally find out what's available and then you can actually go to those pantries to stock your stockpile, right? And so that way, the money you would normally use on groceries, you can start to use that maybe on long term, like the like, you know, dry milk and things like that, canned tuna, salmon, things like that. So you can actually divert your money and spend it on things that are going to be more shelf stable and your fresh food can come from a pantry or you can go to the pantry and freeze it. So, again, um, I was surprised at how many like literally there's 74. So, again, this is a really easy way. Um, it's going to take, you know, a little effort on your part, but let people know there's so many, there's so much food available. It's just a matter of you organizing yourself and going and picking it up. And then from there, you can keep what you want and maybe give to your neighbors what you don't use. Here are some additional places. You have Elizabeth Baptist Church, and I'm not going to read it to you. And you'll see like Hillside, they do fresh vegetables and fruit. Then you see um, Antioch Baptist Church does meat distribution. So again, everyone has a specialty. Right. So the key is once you find out who does what, you can then go each week to all of them or when they actually are open and they provide. So and again, Atlanta Community Food Bank, they can provide things like toothpaste, toothbrushes, um, soaps and things like that. The things that you typically wouldn't get from a food bank. All right. And so to continue. So when we're almost done, by the way, everyone. So thanks for um, sticking with us. So this is actually recommended from FEMA. And these are your basic emergency supply kit. And then, as I said before, um, in the, like, the last slide, I'm going to have kind of a prepper list. And so again, that one gallon of water that you want to make sure that everyone in your house has. So um, especially if it's boiled, you want to make sure you have containers. And typically, you want a dark container in order to keep it as fresh as possible. Um, again, you want to have battery powered hand crank radio. So you'll see um, kind of like this is my fave. Um, you want to make sure that you have a way to communicate. One of the things that, um, and I think it was Captain Canton and other people have talked about is you may be in your home and something may have happened. And if you don't have a way, if the power's out, if you don't have a way and your cell phone's dead and you can't get information in, you may have a rescue truck down the street and you have no idea. It is critical that you have some type of all weather radio um, and you have a way to be able to charge your cell phones and it has a flashlight on. It's actually pretty cool. And I think it's like under $40. You also want to, we talked about flashlights, lots of batteries. You want to make sure that you have like things like a whistle, something that simple to make sure that you're able to notify people um, so they know where you are. You also want to make sure you have a first aid and a medical trauma kit. I'll tell you more about what you should have in that next. By the way, a first aid kit and a trauma kit are different. 
When you think of a first aid kit, you think of boo-boos, like I got a mosquito bite, right? But when you think of a trauma kit, if someone, um, all the time, if there's a storm or something, you're cutting down trees or using a saw, or you step on a nail, you wanna make sure you have a way to clean wounds if you get burned, um, and you wanna have like the trauma scissors, you wanna have things like a tourniquet, you wanna learn how to use the tourniquet. So um, these are just the basic list. And then again, this is just continuing on. We've talked about the prescription medications. If you need more glasses, this is a big one, especially for children, um, infant formula, diapers, um, especially for women, making sure one of the hot commodities whenever something happens is feminine products. So you want to make sure you're stocked up. Things like paper towels, uh, feminine products, deodorant, you can actually stock up on that. They last for so long that you can try to get to a year. Um, another big one is um, the fire um, extinguishers. I actually had to get a new one because mine was so old. I'd had it and it was dusty. I was like, I'm not putting out any kind of fire with this. But you want to make sure that you even, they even have the little cans you can buy. I think they're like $12 um, that you can put out small fires. But you do want to have a fire safety plan. Um, a change of clothing, again, um, you want to have some cash on hand. Especially, I don't know if you guys have seen some banks, like even the one on Cascade, like the bank hours are weird and certain things they're not doing, like the banks have been kind of weird. So if something happens in the United States and there's a bank run, you wanna make sure you have some cash on you. So if you can't get to money or the ATMs are out of money, cause that happens a lot. Like if the bank's closing, you can't, you gotta be able to get to your money. So you wanna make sure you have money on hand. Uh, matches and waterproof containers, um, things like that. And this is the last slide, everyone. So this is a sample prep list. And so you'll see I have it broken up into categories. So you have food. And so things like your spices and seasonings, um, canned protein from tuna, salmon, chicken, spam, all of it. Those last years. So there's nothing worse than bland and nasty foods. So here's what I say to everyone. If you go out and you get these canned vegetables and beans and you get these things, they're going to last for years. So at the at the most you're prepared and you end up, if nothing happens, you basically bought what you already used and you'll just have a year's worth, right? Or you may have two years worth. But again, Captain Canton said, you, it's better to have it than not have it. So um, you just wanna make sure that the things that you stockpile, you will actually eat. Um, I bought some spam, but I'm like, we do not eat spam, but I guess if we got desperate, whatever. So <laughs> whatever those things are, some people are doing a lot of canning. I don't can, I don't know how to can, but some of you may know how to can. So you can actually prepare your own from ground turkey to turkey wings, whatever you wanna do, you can actually can it. Um, but again, yeast, you wanna make sure you have yeast, baking soda, baking powder, powder flour, cornmeal, cornstarch. Those are some of the basics for, of course, your gravies and cooking and making bread. Um, oatmeal, grits, cream of wheat, all of those have long shelf life and they're very filling. Um, the other thing that has a lot long shelf life is honey. And so the key to honey, molasses, maple syrup, um, sugar, you want to make sure it's pure. So you want to make sure it's 100% maple syrup. You want to make sure the molasses and the honey, because those again, like I think honey, like 3 billion years in syrup and maple syrup. But you can't get the ones that have a lot of additives in it because that will spoil faster. Again, you want to make sure you have a way to sweeten. Um, so we've talked about some of the other things, Captain Canton, about the dry beans, rice, pasta, um, long shelf life snacks and popcorn, things like vinegar, soup, chicken and vegetable bouillon. Um, again, if you want to make like, you know, chicken stocks and things like that. Tomato sauce, rotel, condiments. Again, the majority of the stuff on this food list will literally last a long time. And the last one, people always forget about their pets. So if you have three months of food on hand, you want to make sure your pet has three months of food on hand. Um, we've talked about security. So again, I will send this over to the principal so that they can share. You see the first aid kit, some just items you want to make sure you have. And also the trauma kit, as I said before, with the tourniquet, burn gel. You want to make sure you have shears, a splint. And here's the key, um, Captain Canton said it, make sure you know how to use it. So like we literally practice in my house how to actually put a tourniquet on, like how to tighten it, how to put it on, where you put it and things like that. So you wanna make sure you're actually able to use it if you need to. Some of the basics you wanna make sure you have, um, over-the-counter medicines, um, you wanna make sure that especially you wanna stock up on things like whatever kind of pain relief you have, et cetera, tea, coffee, 
trash bags, freezer bags are really important, especially if you're freezing food, especially for long term. So typically what I do is I get plastic wrap and I wrap, I separate my meat out and I wrap it and then I put it in a freezer bag and take the air out. So that way it'll last a lot longer and it won't get freezer burn. So again, I'm not gonna, gonna go down the list because we've talked about it, but I will share this list. Again, these are just a, a really quick list to say, am I prepared? Do I have batteries? Do I have walkie talkies? Do I have light bulbs? Again, I shared this with, <laughs> I did this with my friends and they were like, this is overwhelming. There's so much stuff on here and it is, but the key is pick up little bit by little bit by little bit, right? Um, another big one just to point out that people don't really think about are light bulbs. Make sure you have backup light bulbs. So it doesn't, if, if, something happens and your security lights go out, you need to be able to quickly change your bulbs out. So making sure that you have light bulbs are really important. And what else is on here I wanna kind of talk about? Oh, the breathing tool and having a sewing kit. Let me show you this. I actually was talking to a nurse and we were talking about COVID-19 and, and then this is it and I'll open it up for questions. This is literally like $4, this breathing tool. I think it's called a spirometer. Yeah, spur, yeah, you see it. So um, it literally, when you're in a hospital, one of the things they give this to you in order to have you do breathing exercises to break up if any, li um, any liquid or any um, fluid goes in your lungs so you don't get pneumonia. And really when you think about COVID, it's a respiratory disease or problem. So one of the things they recommend is making sure that you strengthen your lungs, especially if you're older, if you do have underlying conditions. So the stronger your lungs are and you're able to break up the fluid and get, get it out, preventing things like from pneumonia and things like that from setting in, it really does help. And it's literally four bucks. I think it's actually 397. And, or if you have a friend in a hospital, you can get it. So that's a really easy way to kind of help you if you do get sick with the flu or COVID, it'll help you recover a little faster and it'll help you with the breathing. All right, so that concludes our prepping, security and preparedness. Are there any questions before Terry Weeks, our VP, closes out the meeting? Don. Yes, ma'am. Um, this is Ida Robertson. Uh, will you be able to send us a copy of your document if we give you our email address? Yes. And I'm, I will send it to the principals and I can ask, I can also send it to you, Miss Ida. Yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? No questions? No. All right, well, everyone, Terry, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you again. I think Captain Canton is still on the phone, but thank you. Oh, he got off, okay. So Don, if anyone else would like a personal copy sent directly to their inbox, um, please just uh, enter your email address in the chat box and we'll be sure that um, as we attempt to disseminate this information via the principals, we know that all schools don't always get things, um, they don't share things quite the same way, um, but we'll be sure that we can send the information directly to you. And before we close out, we just want to recognize um, at the beginning of the meeting, we um, did a roll call of the cluster schools and we recognize that um, Ms. Delise Perry of Miles made it into the meeting. So we just want to thank you for taking the time to do that. And also Dr. Jones um, from Young Middle School was also able to join us this afternoon, this evening. From Beecher, Ms. Jones? Young Middle School, Dr. Jones. And Dr. Moore from Mays High School made it into the meeting. Yes, the entire Mays administrative staff, <laughs> plus <laughs> staff members. So we just want to especially thank even Dr. Battle for being on, Hi. but especially for all of the staff members from Atlanta Public Schools. We know you will have another early day. Tomorrow is Friday. And um, you guys have to jump off and get, get yourselves ready for another long, another virtual school day tomorrow. But thank you all for being out tonight. All of the parents and other community members, thank you so much for joining this first uh, May's Cluster virtual meeting. And again, our next PTA meeting will be in October, October the 15th. 13? Um, it's October 15th. Yes, 15th at 6 p.m. We're going to go over everything you ever wanted to know about 
all the resources available for you to know where your child is and how to engage your school in the district to make sure your child, if they're behind, catches up um, or just stays on track. So that is going to be, that's going to be a lot of fun. A lot of fun. We have other APS um, personnel that will be joining us to yes. disseminate that information. So thank you all again. And unless there's anything more, good night. And oh, hold um, on, Terry, we have yes. eight members. Keish, our treasurer, just said eight people paid their membership dues. So thank you. That is awesome. And I hope that all of the uh, cluster uh, feeder schools are successful in their membership drives as well. Even though we're virtual, we still need our parent support groups uh, partnered with our schools so that we can be even more successful this school year. So thank you all again for being out tonight and be well as we go forth. Good quick night. Question, quick question, quick question. Sure. Uh, Dr. Morris here. Um, I'm trying to find the dues, you know, I'm a, a teacher and a parent. So I'm trying to find the information for that, but my email is saturated with <laughs> emails with virtual learning. So can you just put in the link right quick? So I can. Um, and it's on the screen too. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 I sent it directly to you, and I'm going to put it up for everybody else as well. But it's dollar sign, out. capital M A Y S, capital H I G H, capital P, capital T, capital S, capital A. <laughs> that's the, uh, the cash app. Dollar sign Maze High PTSA for those who, of you who love, who um, like to join. Mazes PTSA tonight. Okay. And thank you to the eight members who joined on tonight. Okay, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. All right, good thank night. Thank you, everyone. Very good. Very good, Don. Thank you. Thank you, Captain, as well, in his absence. <laughs>